Happy New Year. Happy New Year, John. How are you? Very good. Now, wait a minute. You're not in uh, the same location uh, that I normally see you. So where are you right now? Um, So I'm usually in London, um, but today I'm in Miami in a hotel room. Um, Although enjoying the weather, I must say. Uh, Yeah, I'll be here for another few days before I return to London. Awesome. Well, enjoy yourself. Have a great time. Make sure you say hello to Mickey for me. That's awesome. It will do. Um, All right. So we got a fun show here because we get to predict things and whether they happen or not, no one will remember. So we're going to look awesome together. And um, here's our prediction. So let's kick things off. Uh, So top 10 predictions, technology predictions, 2023. Let's kick things off, uh, Ola, with uh, the first one, which is open AI and uh, generative AI. So tell me about this. What do you think about this? What's what's happening here? I, I think you've probably seen the explosion. I mean, there's no one, I can't go through a conversation today uh, with service providers, with clients, CIOs, CTOs. I mean, it doesn't really matter who I'm talking to. Everyone's talking about chat GPT yeah. or GPT-3. Everyone's talking about it. I've got a client who's actually in higher education He's talking about it because there's this worry that when you have open AI, in other words, AI where everyone can use it, um, someone described it to me the other day as a double click or the second version, or I might say the third life of Google search, right? Yeah. So instead of just bringing you, here's some articles you can go read, it's as if someone's in the background reading all those articles for you, summarizing it and bringing you the, the answer. So, so it just, it's everywhere. And it does, it is a game changer. Um, particularly yeah. because it's open and and therefore, you know, really usable, easy to use. I think it, it's going to have a big impact on how we develop. It can write code. Yeah. <laughs> right. So how does that change how we work in technology and frankly, just how the world works? And generative AI in a similar kind of way can produce, go out and find and gather and source for you and produce actual, can generate content so it can generate articles, heaven help higher education or education at large, right? Um, it can generate um, materials for you to use in a PowerPoint presentation. I, would, I just think this whole area is just going to, it's already exploding and it's really going to explode. explode. Yeah, I think we'll, be the number one prediction. I, I think it's a number one, absolutely. And I think one thing that'll be, that'll be interesting is how will service providers wrap, put wrappers around this So there's solutions utilizing that open AI, right? So I think that's going to be the interesting part that we'll see is how do service providers, uh, you know, generate some income from this or create solutions that empower some of these things? Because I don't see the banks or, or, you know, consumer packaged goods firms just utilizing it raw. I mean, for fun, it's going to be interesting, but over time we'll wrap that. All right. I totally, I love that. Number one. All right. Number two, um, this is the top topic i think we've been talking around for a while but but i think 2023 is going to be big for esg sustainability is on everybody's radar um i was talking to uh pratiba salwin who runs our travel transportation hospitality and she said esg to her was in the top list of what these firms are looking at right so as you think about um you know how are we sustainable not just from the standpoint of sustainable uh, recycling and reusing, but from birth to to uh, to recycling, that whole journey. I was talking to Capgemini and they talked about uh, really modifying their manufacturing process with one of their clients to help them from the ore, creating the ore, saving 30% of the usage of plastic, and then how that life was going to you know, be utilized later on. So I think this is a hot topic for 2023. What are your thoughts? Look, that whole circular economy, um, which is that you know, soup to nuts, birth to, uh, birth to death kind of view, is obviously big. And in Europe, look, this has been on the radar in a far more prominent way, I think, even than it has elsewhere, to the point of being you know, uh, something that we see, not just governments anymore. I mean, it started with governments actually putting requirements on companies uh, related to some subjects, not just in... Um, in in the E, but also in the S and in the G. Uh, So we're seeing that, but we're also now seeing that in companies who are requiring it of service providers, companies who are asking service providers to help them meet their, you know, their carbon goals or their, their, their zero goals. So we see this emerging far more um, in a far more strategic way, I think, in many European 
European countries. And so it's even more prominent there. But let's not forget what's really driving this, I think, or what I see anyway, and a lot of my clients that I talk to, it's their customers that are driving it. Yeah. Customers are actually making decisions about what which product they're going to use, um, which company they're going to go and engage with based on um, how they're actually doing in areas like sustainability and social. So I, I think it's actually being driven uh, by the by the consumers um, far more than I think we think about it. We think about it as, you know, oh, we've got a requirement or we need to do something. But I do think it's consumers that are driving it. Huge one. These one and two could almost just be joined together at the hip and be one A and one B. Yeah, I, I agree. And S is social, by the way. It's not sustainability. And I was talking to Bob Lutz and Bob in our um, in our practice around energy and, um, you know, that whole practice. That's actually a mandate from the clients. They're looking for the social yeah. side. So it's yeah. not just saving the planet. Mm -hmm. It's a social component. So I'm very intrigued what we'll see in 23. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Number three. What do we have for number three? Cost optimization. So... I mean, it's not like this really goes away. <laughs> you have this most years, but obviously with our, um, you know, the, the environment that we have currently and, and our financial environments in most, in most countries, in most of the globe today, in most industries, everyone's looking to say, how do I ensure that I have the most efficient operations that I can possibly have? And that's not just in IT or in technology, it's how do I have efficient operations? How do I optimize my cost in my supply chain, as an example, across my entire firm? And so we're seeing the emergence of, you know, FinOps becoming far more of a more frequent subject. Optimization COEs are becoming a very big thing today, where we see organizations who are even putting together not just, a, you know, um, uh, COEs to help in the area of how do I make sure that my costs remain optimized across my uh, environment. They're even having chief cost off officers being assigned to, or that's their job. Yeah. Um, and this whole idea of ecosystem visualization and orchestration, when we think about cost optimization, a lot of people think about cost takeout and that's kind of their, their, their perspective. But I think for a lot of CIOs that I talk to, it's about looking across and being able to identify areas by visualization where they can orchestrate their supply chains, where they can orchestrate their value chains to ensure that they're just have the most optimized cost profiles that they can within those areas. So it may not even be about cost takeout as much as it is just making sure that we're being as efficient as possible. FinOps is, is huge in this, in this space for sure. Yeah, and I think you brought up a key component is it's optimization, not takeout. And we are very yeah. serious about that at ISG. I was talking to Bill Huber about that is cost takeout could mean a change in the customer or employee experience. Cost optimization means no change and or an enhancement. So it's the idea of how do I optimize without having a sacrifice? Takeout means it could mean a lot of things. So I, I like the fact that ISG thinks about cost optimization than just cost takeout, right? Well, and the other thing I think to keep in mind for our clients is, you know, they're trying to do things on behalf of the consumer. So if they can, you know, uh, optimize their cost basis, potentially they can help their consumers who may, you know, be struggling just due to the economic conditions. And so you're right, taking out cost is not necessarily the the, the real intent here. So I think that's a good one. So, so what's number four, John? All right, let's see number four, industry specialization. So think about this is, you know, we've got cloud and all these other interesting things happening, but it's not generic. And so I think we're going to see a lot more trend towards uh, solutions around specific areas. So it's going to be, you know, financial or it's going to be energy. Um, it's going to be a retail CPG. We're seeing a lot more with regards to these platforms. I mean, I always think about, you know, I go back, to, you know, 15, 20 years in SAP, and it was like this 10 year journey of getting something set up, you know, and then you hoped it worked. Right. And now with the way things are speeding up and these platforms are being developed and clouds is participating, um, we're looking at really industry specialization in, in specific areas. And I think banking, certainly, um, again, retail CPG. What are your what are your thoughts on this? I think it's even gone even a little further in some cases where industry is looking to if you will, insurance would be a great example of saying, I really want to take a specific area of my industry and I want a solution. I don't just want a piece of software. I don't just want a service. I don't just want a platform. Just bring me the whole thing. Soup and nuts. I want an outcome. 
So bring me an outcome, maybe at a specific point within my value chain, maybe for a whole specific function within my organization. So I do think that that's the case. But um, the other thing I think is that industry specialization becomes easier to do because it's much easier for us to develop product today. So with agile ways of working and DevOps and automation and AI, all of these things are being brought to the forefront and have very specific applicability in specific industries. And so I think you're seeing an explosion of the number of software products and platforms and solutions that are very unique to a very specific niche um, within a specific industry. And so I think it makes the landscape more complicated, by the way, for our clients. They have far more choice today. And I think that complicates things for them. It's why I think for ISG, it makes our job a little more complicated because obviously our research you know, aperture has to be much larger, but it also gives us far more um, insight to be able to bring to clients to recognize all of the different ways in which they can source a solution for their specific business need. Yeah, and I think these service providers, it's going to be interesting to see how they shape this in 23 because yeah. there are components of different solutions and software and technology, but they've got to wrap that, to your point, to the end result, what that client's looking for. So this is going to be an interesting one to watch out for. All right, number five. Hybrid cloud ecosystems, look, they're just going to continue. This is really clear. And, 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 and we really mean hybrid. You're going to have on-prem. You're going to have private cloud. You're going to have public cloud. You're going to have multiple public clouds. We just think this ecosystem development is going to continue. I mean, enough said. That, yeah. That's kind of what we think is going to, going to continue. Can't really remove it from the top 10 because everyone's got it on their list, right? It just continues. Yeah. Yeah. I think it continues. I think probably the change from 22 to 23 is it was cloud in 22. And I think you nailed it. It's hybrid cloud. It, yeah. I think we've all gotten a little bit smarter, right? It was like, yeah. hey, wait a minute, let's slow things down a little bit. We don't have to move everything to the cloud, to Amazon or Google, Azure. Let's think about this. And the right things need to go here and some's going to stay here. I, I think that's the key lesson that we learned in 22 that will, will be really uh, popular in 23, right? Yeah, I agree. Number right. six. Number six. All right, my favorite topic, customer experience. Uh, so I love this. I think it includes a lot of things, right? It's it's not just metaverse and you know the experience online. I, I think part that we forget about a lot is that physical experience, right? So retail and that shopping experience, those are back, right? COVID created this uh, this giant momentum of adoption of experience through delivery and all these other areas, but. We're going back into physical. People want to go to places. So customer experience, we have to think about how do you bring all those components together? How do I utilize a mobile device while I'm you know, inside of an experience at Walt Disney World, for example? Or if I'm in a retailer, how am I utilizing all these components? And maybe it's in the metaverse, right? But it's that combination. So definitely keep an eye out for this one. I think customer experience is across every single vertical. Would you agree? I, I would agree. And I think you're right. I think it's really immersive experience, whether you're using uh, gamification as I'm walking through uh, Disney World, which I did just this past weekend because I took that opportunity. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's about that customer experience being ubiquitous. It's across the environment. It's 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 broad. It's not narrowed. And I think we have a tendency to think of customer experience as separate in a brick and mortar store than it is in the e-commerce site. But essentially, you want the same result. You want the you want the customer to be delighted. And if as long as you're as you have that uh, experience in one venue or one channel, why wouldn't you want to have that same uh, experience in another? Yeah, that's good. And this goes back to cost optimization, right? So just disposing of a call center like a airline just did a few weeks ago, that may not lead maybe to not be a really maybe not be a really good idea. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Number seven. Number seven, 5G and edge computing. And look, a lot of this goes back to my ability to be able to see my supply chain, to be able to see what's happening within my environment, to have that visibility that allows me to do things like cost optimization, that allows me to ensure that I'm getting a brilliant customer experience at the end of my value chain. And a lot of that's being, being enabled by uh, the ability for me to use 5G and edge computing to ensure that I can uh, allow my environments to be you know, totally visible. You using things like digital twin to be able to see what needs what's upcoming or what within my supply chain or within my value chain might could be changed could be optimized to eat, not just for cost purposes by the way but for purposes of speed 
to be able to use the data that's happening um, at, at very relevant points within that value chain and take action immediately. So a lot of this is about speed and my ability to do that computing on the edge and take action immediately rather than waiting for you know, something to come back and tell me that that's the right thing to do. So I, I think we're going to see this expand. 5G's come of age now. We've proven out the the uh, the use cases around it. I just think we're going to see it expand and explode in 2023. Yeah, Ola, I, if, if, you know, again, if you think about any of the things we're going to talk about today, the underlying component of this is speed. So I agree with you. I, this is number seven. But from the standpoint of where it sits, it really, if you're working on manufacturing and automating manufacturing, 5G and edge computing are necessary. If you're thinking about autonomous vehicles, 5G edge computing in particular is necessary. So, you know, operating, uh, you know, surgeries. The last thing I want to hear about is a delay in a surgery when I'm having open heart surgery, right? Please. So, yeah, <laughs> please. So, so I get excited about this. And, and Rob Long and the team at, at ISG, I mean, the networking component this has got to be thought about security, right? Bad things move faster. So, so we have to think about this across all the spectrum of the things we talk about. Okay. Number eight. Oh my so, God. I, I know. So I was going to say, you're a great straight man. Um, look, I think a, a SACI approach is really going to come to the forefront here. We need to have a secure edge, but we need to have secure access. And so a focus on cybersecurity, I think alongside your network and alongside how people are getting into your perimeter, I think yeah. are, are really coming together. We're seeing this uh, again be an area. It's always been a focus. I think what uh, SACI does, in my mind anyway, is bring subjects together that I think may have been a bit apart for a while um, and really need to be considered in sequence and, and in tandem. They need to come together. And so cybersecurity is great, but to say, I'm just gonna go and uh, be able to monitor and then respond to, to what's happening within my environment is not good enough. I need yeah. the ability to secure my environment to, to make sure that the poor actors aren't getting in. And that has to do with the edge and making sure that I am securing that edge and securing my access uh, you know, based on persona so that I get the right people coming in to the right um, opening apertures at the right level for the right personas, that sort of thing. So I, I do think that this is a really good movement. I've seen a lot of movement in this in 2022. I expect to see a lot of it happening again in, in 2023. Yeah. And the numbers are astonishing with regards to uh, what this costs when we make, yeah. uh, when we sacrifice security, uh, Doug Sailors. I mean, if we're, if you're not having conversations with Doug and just learning more about this, I mean, we're even getting into this stuff to help mitigate it through education because that, you know, most of this cybersecurity uh, attacks end up happening because of the human side, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I really, I think this is a keep your eye on it. Um, it ties in with a lot of the topics we're talking about. If you're going to do anything, you probably have to think about security as that wrapper. And it's a really big area of risk. I think one of the things that ISG is doing is um, helping clients equate the risk that they have to a dollar figure, because that's what your C-suite hears. When they yeah. hear vulnerability or the number of vulnerability or the amount of vulnerability, that, do that doesn't resonate with them nearly as much as if you can tell them this is the amount of money that's at risk involved in your cybersecurity assessment. And so the ability to put a dollar figure on that, I think, for our enterprise clients is huge and allows them to really see and have a sense of the amount of risk that potentially is within their environment related to cyber cybersecurity. Listen, so I think it's huge. It's huge. I was at dinner last night with a large service provider and he had to leave the table to take a call for a hundred million dollar deal uh, around manufacturing. And here's where the sticking point was. And he came back somewhat frustrated and nervous was the lawyers on the call. The deal was done. The lawyers on the call said, we want you to have unlimited liability on bad actors can't be done yeah can't, how do wow. you do that so so i think the big question on number eight is going to be is how does everybody mitigate this i i think enterprise clients are going to say well, we want to pass this off to the provider but the provider unlimited on bad actors i mean you know how many russians and middle east i mean there's challenges and you can't yeah. you can't protect all that. so this is going to be a hot topic in 23 i think so too all right what about number nine 
number nine, my favorite number. Um, employee talent, hybrid work models. I mean, look, we've we've done as a as a society, as a globe, an incredible job with a global pandemic, right? Wow. But we're outside the other side of this now. 2022 was lack of employees. 2023 now is all of a sudden 1,500 uh, layoffs per day in tech, right? Layoffs are being announced by large. We just had a large bank in New York laying off 1,500 again uh, this month. You know, lots of things are changing. So how does how do we keep the talent um, in this hybrid work environment? I think is going to be a real a real challenge and an opportunity, right? Retention of the right people and then optimizing optimizing, not reduction, but optimizing the workforce. What are your thoughts? Well, I think if you look at our last index figures, you, 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 there's, there's a subtlety to this that I don't think uh, are, is appreciated very much, which is that the amount of um, new employees that we've hired uh, from 2016 to, to 2022 is phenomenal. And so yeah. I think a lot of what we might be seeing uh, in some of the talent layoffs that we're seeing in some of the it, it, what we're seeing in the media may be more of a correction than anything that, you know, is really, oh my goodness, you know, we have, we have a huge problem here. Having said that, what you don't want to do is lose the right talent. You don't want the great talent to leave, right? So having talent development programs and retention, I think are huge for organizations. I think far more interesting, even though that of course is the core of, of what most of us are interested in is, is the employee experience but it's also this hybrid working model. And do you have a hybrid working model? And that hasn't really played out, I don't think, in its entirety, because you see uh, companies and organizations having much different perspectives on that. We've got some companies who've come through and said, nope, nobody can work from home. Everybody has to come into the office. We've got others who have said, sure, you can work from home, but by the way, if you do, it's gonna limit your career progression. And here's why, right? Um, it, it has definitely has an implication on our ability to develop talent, and it definitely has an implication in those hybrid models or those work from home models in our ability to engage with employees, particularly younger employees. So I still think there's a lot of work to be done here to ensure that post pandemic, and let's just be real, the pandemic was a very unnatural situation and yeah. we, we handled it brilliantly, but it was unnatural. So what's the new natural and how do we ensure that we have employee experience that's allows us to retain employees, that allows us to, to develop and retain our talent. I think that's going to be a big push for 2023 and beyond. Yeah, we just added to our whole organizational change management group uh, a whole asset around mentorship, um, you know, uh, happiness at work, yeah. powered by Happy's. Beth yeah. Thompson just came on as a partner at ISG. And this is this is a big area. And again, it's, it's a retention of the right people because, you know, Elon Musk, you know, whether you love him or don't love him, he's been entertaining and he's given, he gave permission to tech to lay people off because he laid off what 70% of Twitter. So it was like, all right, great. If I lay off 15%, I don't look bad yeah. because you know, the bar was high. So I think that's the correction that we're seeing and we'll see that through Q1, but then it's going to be back to, to hiring and then retaining to your point, retaining that right talent. That's going to be that's going to be the interesting piece. This is this will be interesting to see. Uh, number 10, our 10th one, continue expansion of natural language processing, biometrics, geometric. Tell me, I, tell me about this because I'm not as smart as you on this. So tell me. Well, I'm not that smart on it either, but we have brilliant people at ISG who've really kind of been trying to mentor me through, through some of this. But if you think about it and you think about how contact centers – and as we call contact centers and we want contact centers to have a human being on the other side, or we want to use Alexa or we want to use Siri, right? But these natural language processors are getting better and better and better to the point where some of these natural language processors, when you call up and you're actually talking to what you think is a human being on the other end of the phone, actually is not a human being. Yeah, It's not, it's an AI connected to a natural language processor. So I just think that's fascinating. Biometrics, our ability to be able to hopefully start to drive, by the way, in all of these subjects, particularly in AI, NLP and biometrics, uh, our ability to ensure that we are uh, consciously looking at unconscious bi on bias on things like our ability to um, be able to 
uh, do face re facial recognition and those sorts of things. But I think all of that is uh, really starting to emerge as useful product. Used to be sort of an interesting thing, sort of chat GPT, sort of an interesting thing today. These yeah. tend to emerge once we apply some, some better logic and potentially even some better um, standards around them where they actually become extremely useful um, to us in, in industry. So I think all of these things are starting to emerge as better and better uh, capabilities over time. And science is, uh, you know, wonderful anyway, that it's just this ability to do these things, but it is getting so much better. Uh, I saw uh, uh, something on, on, on the uh, news just the other day on a natural language processor, and they had a, had a gentleman, they said, can you tell the difference? They had him talk to a person, real quick question, talk to a, a natural language processor, real quick question. He couldn't tell. He was like, I, I think maybe the second one was the human. And they said, no, the second one was actually the, you know, the NLP. So, so these, I think these are just, again, enablers of our ability to optimize how we present um, capabilities back to our customers at the end of the day. I think that's what these all are. And well, that, AI piece, that AI piece is really, really an important uh, piece, I think. The what is? The, uh, the artificial intelligence as an yeah. underpinning for a lot of these things. All right. So the good news for ISG and enterprise clients and service providers, well, not so much for enterprise, but for service providers and ISG is 99% of the time I call a call center, I am still talking to press one for, yes. press two for, right? Or say one. That's yes. not what we're talking about. No. So this is a huge opportunity. Number 10 yeah. should be a huge opportunity. All right. Yeah. Now, listen, Ola, I couldn't help myself. I had to do it. Um, we did that all by ourselves, the top 10, okay, um, through interviews of our own people and everything else. But then I had to ask chat GBT, oh my. it's top 10. And here's what we, here's what we found, Ola. And you know what? We're pretty smart, you and I, because we're pretty darn close. Look at the tie-in with regards to the, our thoughts and chat GBT. Anything missing? What do you think that we missed? Well, first of all, said another way, John, why did we do all that work? I, we okay. should, should have gone to chat GPT and we could have got a pretty good a pretty good thing. Look, I think this is a great list. How could it not be? And there's only a few things here that really we didn't really touch on. We didn't really touch on blockchain. We didn't really touch on quantum, right? That's not really something that we did. Robotics in the drone area, you know, we didn't really talk on that. But literally everything else here was on our list as well. And I think it's it's incredibly interesting that ChatGPT, which is an AI, has artificial intelligence and machine learning as its number one trend. So, so I think that's that's uh there's that's, bias. That's I ironic. Think there's bias there might be a little bit of an intentional bias in here, just a little bit. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. Yeah. So if you want that list, this will we'll, we'll make sure we put that into the chat. I think it's a fun thing to have, um, you know, again, and we'll take, keep an eye on this over 2023 and see if uh, the Ola John combo is a little bit smarter than chat GBT. Uh, and if we're not, then we're not going to talk about it. But if we are, we're going to bring it up at the end of the year. So thank you so much. Any other final thoughts or comments on 23? You excited? I, I really am excited about 2023. Look at just a couple of final thoughts. I think one is, um, you know, we're all talking about, if I hear the word headwinds again, I might fall <laughs> over, but you know, we do have a lot, a lot of headwinds in a lot of areas that, you know, the uh, economic conditions in, in many of our, of our geographies notwithstanding. But I also think I am highly uh, maybe just excited and, and I have a lot of optimism based on um, some of the things we've chatted through today as well as what I just see happening in the market. I think you can't stop transformation and you can't really stop improvement and you can't really stop evolution. And I think technology is evolving. And I don't think you really you really stop that. And I see a lot of excitement in the market around that. Yeah, Ola, we were together last week in Miami with Hexaware, Atos and LTI Mindtree. And, and frankly, uh, the two days was nothing less than inspiring. That's right. Um, Right. There are some incredible things that are happening that are making the world a better place, that are creating better customer and employee experiences. So I, I am energized. I think we've had a tough couple of years. I think the headwinds fine, whatever you want to call it. Let's just change the direction of the sales. There you go. And let's and let's leverage them. Right. 
Um, so I think I'm, I'm excited. So listen, here's to a great year and it, wonderful seeing you and have a safe travels back to London. Take care. Thank you very much. Great to see you, John. Bye, Ola. Bye-bye.